Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to Scratch Claw Push. We're doing a bonus episode uh, where you get to meet your hosts. And today I'm interviewing the one and only Billy Joe Cones, my co-host, co-producer, partner in crime. So, hello. how are you doing there with your with your diva shades? I'm, uh, you know, just by the time this episode comes out, we will both be on vacation, I believe. So I was like. I'm just going to go with it. Yeah, I will be in a much uh, uh, colder, well, not too much colder climate, but not nowhere near as uh, tropical. So I'll be in Wisconsin. <laughs> oh, well, oh, well, I'm serious. I'm saying you look like you're ready to go to the beach. I'm sure they can. I will know, go to the beach in like Minnesota. Like a lake or something? For sure. Yeah, yeah. Actually, well, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll, I have plans to go to the beach in Minneapolis with my friend Jane. And then um, my sister and I like to go to Lake Wazi in Black River Falls, which is a man-made lake. It's a former quarry. So, mm. Okay. Yeah. So we have a thing we like to do with our guests where oh, right. we, the, the, uh, the one minute uh, <laughs> curriculum vitae, or as I like to call it, your verbal resume. Um, so I am going to give you one minute and we're going to see if you can do what all of our guests have done. Like, in fact, we've, at this point, we've interviewed, was it five or six people? And only uh, two of them have missed it, but only missed it by a few seconds. So one went over, two were off, two, two finished four before, and you yeah, got so it. Right like, on, so I'm saying, like, uh, most people get it in just barely under a minute, but mm -hmm. most the people that did miss it didn't miss it by much. No. So, okay. We'll stand by. I'm feeling and, a lot of pressure, Brandon. <laughs> okay. I'm going to get, I'm going to, Okay, so and ready in three, two, one. Hi, I'm Billy Joe Cones. I am a Midwesterner now living in Atlanta, Georgia. I am a lifelong actor, stage. Uh, I've done improv. I've done musical theater. I've done Commedia dell'arte. Pretty much everything you can think of, except for stand up or burlesque. Those are the two things, and circus. Those are the things I haven't done. Um, I now do mostly voiceover these days. Uh, I write a blog about the industry and about just general accountability stuff. I'm really in, big into accountability groups, and I love talking to creative people. Um, I, like I said, I write. I've written a few short screenplays, which I would love to produce someday. And I am now creating a podcast with Brendan Duke. And I also am the voice of a few other characters in podcasts like... Um, Rum Runner Sue with Icebox Radio. And uh, uh, that's that's all I can think of right now, to be honest. Oh, look at that. <laughs> right on the nose. <laughs> that is that's pretty good. Like, I, I'm, I'm very uh, I'm very proud of us. When I did mine, I actually got like right on it. So you you did the same. You came in right virtual at right. High at, five. Yes. Virtual high five. <laughs> right on it. <laughs> that is good stuff. Mm -hmm. You work so, in TV. Yeah. I'm in voiceover. That's we got the 60 seconds down. I know, man. It's, it's so much of the stuff just revolves around the minute. I mean, I know you you've already posited the theory that like we somehow instinctively know what a minute is as human beings. And I do, uh, so I far, do, for sure. So yeah. So where did this uh, this acting bug come from? You've obviously got a long, you know, you've you've been in the game for a minute and you've done uh, done a bit. So where did, mm -hmm. where did that, uh, what inspired all of that? Oh, I can tell you that in two seconds. Um, my high school, my aunt, not my high school, my aunt, Anne, well, my mom's youngest sister, uh, she's only like nine years older than me. And when I was like, oh, that's not true. She's older than that. Um, but when I was like three, they took me to see her high school production of Oklahoma. And I remember sitting in the chair next to my grandma and watching this production and seeing my aunt in her pretty green dress and watching all the people singing and dancing and being like, oh, they went in that little house. I wonder what's inside the house. What do they do when they go in that house? You know, and just being totally intrigued by it. So ever since I was three, I wanted to be an actor. And I wrote my first play probably around age six. It was a Thanksgiving short play about uh, – two farmers and two turkeys and didn't end well for the turkeys. It was kind of a tragedy. <laughs> um, and I forced all my cousins to be in this play. 
Um, and if they weren't in the play, then they were like, oh, our dressing room security guard, my cousin Oren, who's like in the army, you know, now <laughs> he was our dressing room security guard and it makes sense. But yeah, I, I would just enlist all my cousins constantly to do magic shows, news programs, fashion shows, uh, plays, constant. I would go upstairs and sell tickets to my mom's family and be like, come downstairs, see our show. And they'd be like, oh, God, she's doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's where that came from. Oh, I have to ask, what uh, what part did your aunt have? in uh, Oklahoma. Oh, I think she was just in the chorus. Okay. Well, st well, still, she's, yeah, that's, it's still cool though. You, that's uh, in a musical, you know, and you're, you still need your chorus. So uh, yeah, helps, helps fill it out. That's a, uh, that, that's one of those that I know my mother got me into watching those back in the day. Like, you know, cause of course me and my brother being like two kids of the eighties, like we didn't want to watch anything that didn't have like, you know, ninjas or fighting in it or anything <laughs> that didn't have those. And eventually she started conning us into watching musicals. And that was kind of Oklahoma was one of the first big ones I remember. Mm. And having her like having explaining, oh, oh, like, you know, when uh, poor Judd is dead, having to explain that. So where he's, he's like, he's trying to talk this guy into killing himself. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God, this is dark as hell. A lot of Rogers and Hammerstein is way darker than people give it credit for being, you know? Yeah, it, it's. I mean, there's I a whole song about racism that people just kind of forget about. Mm. And then there's the whole like wife beating thing in Carousel that it's just like, what? What is this musical about again? I guess it's the uh, it's the sting effect where you can write something really depressing or dark. As long as you put it to a happy melody, it uh, mm. it usually just goes over most people's heads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, you know, coming from the, <laughs> the guy who wrote a whole song about a stalker and everybody thinks it sounds romantic because of the way he sings it. No, every it breath really you doesn't. take. <laughs> Not nowadays. We kind of we figured it out, but there was a, for the longest time. We're like, "Oh, it's so sweet." It's like, "No, it's not. It's really not." So no. So you okay? You starting out in the Midwest. What was it that uh, lured you down here to Atlanta? Oh God, I'm skipping a lot of time, but um, I came down. Or uh, no, or tell us like how what what is that? What's that process? Obviously, I think you you did spend some time in New York. If I'm not mistaken no or no no i did not um so yeah my journey was grew up in La Crosse, wisconsin moved to arizona for three years like 11 to 13 i lived in yuma arizona and that's the place that people go why or if i say i lived in yuma people go oh i'm so sorry because <laughs> the only reasons to live there is basically if your family's the military and mine was not my mom got her first teaching job down there. So right out of college, she needed a job and nobody up in the Midwest would hire someone right out of college. And so we moved to Arizona, sight unseen. Like we literally packed up and moved down there. It took us seven days to drive down there with our cat and the car all packed up. Someday I'm gonna write a book about this or, so or play or something. Um, but yeah, seven days to get ready to move and then like seven days to move and then we were on our way. So we went down there and then for high school, came back up to Wisconsin, went to high school on the other side of the state in the Fox Valley in Menasha, which nobody's ever heard of. People know Nina if they know anything because of the manhole covers. That's where Kimberly Clark is and, uh, you know, all the paper mills. But uh, went to high school over there, went to college in Minneapolis because I got into Madison in Minneapolis. And uh, my mom kept trying to talk me into going closer to home. And I was like, mm, no. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I ended up going to school in Minnesota and just never left. I mean, Minnesota is – Wisconsin has my heart. I mean, I love Wisconsin so much. But I also feel a little bit like it's too small town for me to ever truly live there. Maybe that will change, but uh, Minneapolis is like where all the people that can't handle living in a small town in Wisconsin go. It's either there or Chicago, so the only big cities that aren't in the state. So I love Minnesota. I love it there. I really, really do. I moved down here because my boyfriend and I started dating long distance, 
and also there was film industry here and he was working in the film industry and I was like, well, there's no opportunity to work in the film industry in Minnesota anymore because that all kind of stopped around the 2002-ish strike. Um, Minnesota lost its tax incentives and so there was no more film there anymore. And I was like, well, there's a lot of film in Atlanta, a lot in Georgia. So I came down here and then the pandemic shut everything down. And uh, it's a good thing I already, I had this lovely booth on order already and I was already doing mo mostly focused on voiceover. So it, it's, you know, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It is what it is. Yeah. I mean, well, they, we, we got, we managed to get enough uh, stuff in before the pandemic to have established a reputation here in Atlanta. I guess we, we, you know, got it, managed to get our, uh, get a toehold in the industry or now in Atlanta. Well, I mean, it's funny because, you know, I, I am originally from Georgia. So the idea of Atlanta being suddenly like this film Mecca, you know, there's part of me that's, you know, still kind of just kind of like dismayed because growing up, that was so not the case. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, you know, the only thing we had in Atlanta was Turner Broadcasting. Mm. And, and, uh, and even that was a lot of like, you know, old shows that Ted Turner had just bought. So the, and then of course, you know, CNN eventually comes on. So then we're known for that. And then back in the kind of early, was it like mid to late two thousands? That's when I think they start the tax incentives and then everything starts really taking off. So, mm -hmm. and now yeah. like one of the most popular shows on, on a streaming platform is shot in my hometown. So, <laughs> which still blows my mind. That's awesome. My hometown is the, uh, is it the bicycling capital of the it's not bicycling capital of the world because that that seems like yeah that's it's seems uh, like a bit of a leap bicycling capital of the country i don't mm. know what they i don't know we had to, i'm sure there's we can look that up there's this there's i'm sure there's websites dedicated to yeah Bi bicycling capital of america it's the self-proclaimed <laughs> Self-proclaimed. Okay. So they, um, they just wanted to like, we got to put our flag and something and that's, that's what we're going to go with. My hometown has a museum that is a bicycling museum and Deke Slayton astronaut museum. Cause mm -hmm. Deke Slayton, one of the Mercury seven is from my hometown. Oh, nice. Let's see. Yeah. We, yeah. I think, uh, I don't think Jackson has any, uh, famous citizens to boast of. Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> I think, I think we did get like one guy who went to the NFL, the guy I went to college with, but he, I don't think he did a lot there. Um, and then, like I said, nowadays it's known for just being the, the backdrop of stranger things. So, yeah. So like, tell me like, how did, so did you've done a lot of work in voiceover and that's probably, I think the thing lately that probably anyone out there might know you from, cause um, uh, you've actually worked with a, a a mutual friend of ours, Jeff Adams for mm -hmm. Icebox Radio Theater. You are the voice of Rum Runner Sue for anyone mm -hmm. that's a, a fan of those series. So like tell so did voice acting just kind of come by like as a necessity or was it something you'd always had an interest in or did you just kind of find just kind of amble sideways into that? <laughs> I just yeah, I drunkenly just veered off the path and uh <laughs> kind of fell in this gutter. No. Um Let's see. So I, when I was a kid, you know, I was obsessed with radio. Like I really loved listening to the radio. I had, you know, a boom box and I had cassette tapes and I would like make my own commercials and just record stuff all the time. And I'd be like yelling downstairs, like mom, shh, I'm recording. So, and I used to like read stories to my stuffed animals while sitting in my closet. Like, I feel like being being a creative child and an only child who was left alone a lot because my parents you know we grew up poor and we were like my parents were always working i was just by myself a lot and just had to entertain myself and so between the radio and um just reading i guess i did a lot of that stuff so i think while I haven't done audiobooks yet, I'm not really ruling it out because I feel like I've kind of, I'm such a, an avid reader and 
just storytelling is sort of in my blood. But but mainly like radio was my thing that I really like loved when I was a kid. Um, you know, when we were little, like TV wasn't as exciting. I didn't have cable. So we only had a couple stations. And I don't know about you, but like when I was a kid and not having cable, the main stations on the weekend were terribly boring. <laughs> so boring. Like unless you were a sports fan, there was nothing for you on the weekends. Yeah. I mean, like they only had like cartoons, you know, like would, oh. uh, for a few hours, like on the yeah. afternoons or in the weekdays or in the early morning on Saturday. So you had to get up. Yes. You know, I mean, yeah. Not, yeah, as, yeah. not as bad when you're a little kid, but that you had your very, for being a kid back, you know, at a certain time, you didn't have the options you do today. So you had to kind of pick your window of when you were going <laughs> to, you know, be able to watch your favorite shows on television or otherwise it was just slim pickings. Yeah. And that's what I, I guess that's what I mean is like Saturday morning you had cartoons, but by mid afternoon they were done. And then Sundays was like an absolute wasteland of TV, at least until the Disney, whatever that was on Sunday nights. Yeah. No, like there, I, was, there was, yeah. Cause like, well, we, I, I was like you, we didn't have a lot of, we didn't have cable regularly until I got to be almost in high school because mm -hmm. just where the places were either we couldn't afford it. Um, mm -hmm. Both my parents were social workers, so we didn't have a lot of money. So either we'd have to like get the free weekend and then you're like furiously taping everything off of television. So we creating our own little video library at home. Um, that's how we'd watch movies. Cause it'd just be like, okay, what's coming on this weekend? Just like, you know, buy a bunch of tapes and there'd be like three movies on three random movies on one tape. So you, you'd have like a horror movie sci or like a horror movie, romance movie and a comedy all on like occupying one tape. And it was just depending on what you kind of, kind of remember where the time code is so you could get to it. Mm -hmm. But you know, this is random stuff like that. So, but yeah, I also feel like that too, that, uh, that helps you develop your imagination. Cause when you're left in those straits like that, you have to kind of really, you learn how to entertain yourself and it, it definitely strengthens those muscles. Like if you're going to be a writer or an actor, yeah, you know, it, it definitely, uh, I, I think it's, it's one of those things that's not fun at the time, but you look back on it and say that it, it's useful, you know, because of what it kind of forces out of you. Yeah. And as a child, I mean, that's all I ever did was I, I wanted, I wanted to act, I wanted to write and I wanted to sing and I, I loved art. And so I was constantly like, you and I kind of talked before, um, in your interview about, you know, limitations and creating with what you've got. And I would just like take random i speaking of taking trash you talked about you know people taking trash and making something out of it i used to dig scraps out of my grandma's um trash can in her sewing room she would just like throw fabric scraps in there and i would you know it'd be stuff she would not be able to use and i would dig it out and be like "Ooh, i'm gonna make my barbie a halter top with this and i would totally just make my barbie a halter dress or something and i would just sew stuff like that um so I think I was always creating something, whether it was like a bee made out of wax paper and <laughs> I think made a flower out of wax paper and a little bee out of uh, tin foil and like, you know, or like things out of clay or whatever it was. I was always creating. I was always singing. I was always writing. Um, and I was always playing pretend in some way. So, and dressing up in weird clothes, a lot of that too. Like <laughs> I was always the weird child with like, a weird scarf on her head or wearing some dress from the sixties that her mom got at the thrift shop as a costume, you know, cause back then nobody bought their kids, like these princess dresses and things that kids are like, Hey, I'm going to wear my Halloween costume every day now because I want to be a Disney princess. I didn't have that. And my mom wouldn't even buy me the costumes with the plastic mask and the, the crappy smock thing. Like, she wouldn't buy me that. She's like, no, you can use your imagination. You can come up with something better than that that is more interesting. 
Yeah, I remember having like a brown towel I would use like as a loincloth for like playing Tarzan or like I had like this gold sweater when I wanted to play Star Trek and be like Captain Kirk. And I had a blue one, too, in case I wanted to be Spock. So mm. you, know, you just kind of swap them out depending on I had a whole like wardrobe change thing going on in my closet. To, depending on what 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 TV show I wanted to act out that day or you're you're you're, yeah. you're making movies in your head using your little Star Wars figures. Yeah, you know, and you know, occasionally, you know, and C-3PO gets lost on an away mission because he gets buried in the sand, and then you can't remember where you buried him, and he's just now he's he's gone, <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, but it's again, great. You know that uh, it, it's funny. You look back on it now, I, and you just go, yeah. You even yeah, the seeds were were already there, and it just took them you know years to grow. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I I look back and I see like the thread of everything I've done makes total sense. Um, like you asked me when I started, like I only started doing voiceover seven years ago, but up until that point, I mean, I went to college to get a degree in theater. I did like 40 full length stage productions. I did on camera work in like film and commercial. And then, you know, I was constantly learning other skills too. Like I've taken clowning classes and I've done physical theater and I've done device theater and improv and all these things. And just always been delving into different little niches within, you know, theater within acting. What um, is one thing that you found useful that you would not have, a, would not have thought about going into it? Like, you know, where some, some random, what, like, of, of all the stuff you've learned in all these different areas you've gotten into, was there one thing that you found way more useful than you would have thought going into it? Yes. Um, useful or interesting? Useful, I would say improv. Either or. Absolutely useful. Improv. I did not want to do improv. I was scared of it. Like, I, I saw my first improv show at Comedy Sports in Green Bay when I was in high school. And I remember just being like, wow, these people are amazing. And, um, and I'd never seen improv before. And I was just so blown away by it that, that they could create things on the spot without, and be so funny. And, um, I was like, I could never do that. And then I, my, my ex pushed me into doing improv and was like, it's good for you. It'll be good for you. And I'm like, I know, but I'm scared. And you know, I think the thing about improv is that it allowed me to let out the playful side of me that got pushed down somewhere between, you know, puberty and adulthood, basically. Like, I was a really playful child. I was a real weirdo. And I was so just like, I didn't care what people thought. And then, you know, somewhere around age, I don't know, between nine and 11, you start caring a lot about what people think and you you start trying to be you start trying to look right and act right and you know everyone stops thinking of you as cute and just wants you to be well behaved and as a girl especially they want you to be well behaved and polite and diminutive and it's awful to be honest, it's, it's awful. Yeah, it's definitely, I feel like that, that, uh, that transition from being a kid into being a teenager is definitely more brutal for women than men. I feel as men, you're still allowed to kind of cut up and, you know, there's a, I mean, I mean, it's, it's a lot less now the whole boys will be boys and that can get us into a weird conversation, <laughs> but you know, you're still, I, I think you're, you're, it's not as frowned upon to kind of be as, is a uh, crazy and kind of playful as a guy, as it is for a, a woman. I feel like there's, there's an extra <laughs> little bit of pressure and you can, obviously I don't know mm -hmm. from experience. I'm just going off of what other people have told me. Do you Absolutely. feel like that? Do you feel like that's a, is a thing that like, I guess that, uh, that kind of, is that something that kind of drove you into acting? Cause it's like, now you've got to, it gives you that space to kind of like access all those other parts of you that are kind of constantly being tamped down from that point on? Um, I don't, I don't think that I know that's was necessarily, a deep psychological question. <laughs> I don't think that was necessarily a driver. I mean, I think I just always wanted to act. I always wanted to 
you know, well, be creative, tell stories, um, present things. Uh, but no, I, I think it just took me a long time. And I think improv was one of the things that really helped me get out of that. When I was in college, I got, I, I wasn't, I was not a good actor at all in college. I was terrible. <clears throat> I know I was terrible. And the critique I got a lot was like, you know, it feels like you're just talking. You're not connected. And I, I even felt it. I felt like I was cut off right here. I was not in touch with my body. Um, and improv, you know, I got told I was in my head a lot. And that's true. I thought too much about how I needed to sound or look or, you know, be. And I think that all comes from the puberty stuff from, you know, now you need to be attractive. You need to be pretty. You need to be skinny. You need to be all these things. And you also need to present yourself in a way that is acceptable. Um, and, you know, basically you just file down all these parts of yourself and improv. It's like, you are completely, you have to free yourself of all the mental shackles, all the physical things you put on yourself and just be and just do. I think it's more about doing. You're just doing without thinking about it at all. And truly taking chances, truly making bold choices. And that's something that I I really struggled with at first, but and I knew I was scared of it for good reason, but it helped me so much to get out there, do improv. And really just um, free myself of all of that that had been put on me. So between improv and then doing commedia, which is just a different type of improv, really. Um, really feeling just totally free and playful with people again and, and being able to put that into my other work. That's been the most useful and fun thing, I think. Very cool. Uh, do you have, is, is there anything similar to that with voice where you're not now you can just, is there a certain, like where you're not having to be concerned with your, you know, like, have, you know, I know for like actors, a lot of times they might get, just get cast just because they have a certain look. So it has mm -hmm. nothing to do with your skill, unfortunately, or that, but it's like with the voice, is there like a, is there a, at least it seems to me, cause I've, I've never, you know, what little voice acting I've done, um, I've found it like it's, it's cool just because now it's like, okay, what can you do, mm. you know, just with your voice? What kind of like you can put on an accent or put on another, you know, change your pitch, change your register. And now you've got access to this whole other thing that I, to a part, I know I wouldn't get if I was actually having to go out for it myself. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I, I never came to this from the perspective of wanting to do, it's not that I don't want to do animation. It's just never been my primary focus. I really like commercials, to be honest. Um, and I like storytelling. But, you know, the the small amount of animation work that I've gotten to do in workshops and things is super fun. It's so fun. And you do have more flexibility and more range when you're not being limited by what you look like. However, now voice acting is so much about authenticity and having authentic voices that there is a little less, I would say there's a little less, a little more constraint on that than there used to be. You know, now it's like, they don't want someone putting on a British accent for this commercial. They want someone who actually is British. They want that authentic voice. So, you know, your, your opportunities to use those things are a little bit more if you do audiobooks, because then you have to be able to do all the voices. Mm -hmm. Um, and you do have some ability to do that within animation or video game stuff, but just not quite as much as there used to be. Um, but it's interesting because you were talking about that freedom. And I think that's the same as what you get in Commedia. In Commedia, you, you get to play, you know, you put on a mask and you are, you know, that character. Um, and you become that character. And you kind of discover which ones you fit with best. I don't know if you've ever done mask work like that. I have not. I am. I 
have taken classes where they've it's been talked about, but it's not something I ever really studied, you know, in in any kind of depth whatsoever. But I, yeah. I've heard people talk about it where they say, yeah, there's something about like connecting with those masks and the mask itself is kind of like a character and you're kind of finding which one you can best pour yourself into. Yeah. And I had always, you know, been cast as ingenues when I was younger, you know, I was just like, I was blonde and I was blue eyed and people just went ingenue. And I had one director who I worked with who was like, Billy Joe, people just look at you and they see like pretty, like, but you know, she's like, I don't see that. She's like, other people see beautiful. I see beautiful with a knife. Like you are not an ingenue. And I was like, huh, I like that. Like to me, it was her saying like, you're, you're not uninteresting enough to be an ingenue. <laughs> like you got too much going on to fit that bland role. And I was like, okay, all right, I'll take that. Cause I always struggled to play the ingenue, to be honest, because it was, eh. and you know, I feel like it's, it is more interesting when you get to play a villain or when I was like 11 years old, I used to do these two old lady characters for my mom all the time. I would Edith and Edna, and I'd make up little stories about Edith and Edna and their adventures. And, um, and my mom just always loves it when I'm playing like either an old person or somebody who's just very much outside of me. She loves it when I play bitchy characters. Like I got to play chick in crimes of the heart at one point. And she was like, Oh, I love it when you get to play. Like, <laughs> I'm just like, chick's a terrible character. Like she's so awful. But it was fun. I mean, yeah. So, so notice, like uh, over the years, like one of the reasons I reached out to you to do Scratch Call Push is you write a lot. Of, you do a lot of coaching, and you write a lot of, you know, with through your blog and on social media, kind of write about the state of the industry, and then kind of talk about ways to kind of get things done, or kind of, you know, mm. you, you someone obviously you you've put a lot of thought into kind of you know things outside of just acting um so how did like what did that this is that something that sprung out of you know like a need like for your acting or is that just something you've all again you sound like you've always had pretty varied interest and it was just a way of tapping into that other stuff that you're interested in outside of acting yeah so then the the accountability stuff um definitely sprang out of a need that i had um and that's kind of where this whole podcast idea came from also is that I, like I said, I was, I came out of high school having pretty much always had the lead in high school. Um, cause my high school was not a very artsy high school, so I didn't have a lot of competition. And so I, I was lucky enough to, to be the lead in a lot of the shows while I was in high school. And then I got out of high school and I went to college and I was all of a sudden at a very large school with a lot more competition of students who had gone to very intense arts high schools. I mean, I went to college with people who came from like um, Minneapolis South, which is where Josh Hartnett went to like some bun bunch of my friends went to high school with Josh Hartnett um, and, and other people who ended up becoming Hollywood stars too. And so I got to college and all of a sudden I'm competing against people who have so much more experience and have been pushed so much harder than me. And I was not good. And I, my school was not an intense school in the sense of they weren't, it wasn't in a, what do you call it? Like a, a conservatory program. There was no BA, there was no BFA in acting yet. It was just a BA program. So there wasn't a lot there um, to help me. And I got out of college still just feeling very adrift and not only adrift in like my skills as an actor and just feeling like inadequate, but also not knowing what to do with myself besides go get a serving job, which is what I did. I got a serving job and a part-time office job. And that's kind of what my life was for a, a long time. And I was just sort of floating around adrift, totally had a quarter life crisis that coincided with my grandfather's death. And, and it was really a struggle because I, 
you know, my mom was on my case a lot about getting a real job. And I knew I did not want to work in corporate America. I didn't want to have a full-time job. I never wanted that. All I wanted to do was act. And I didn't really know how to be proactive about it. And then I, I was in this acting class for professional actors and I was in there for a very long time. And my teacher kept pushing us to start what he called the admin group, which was like an accountability group for actors to get their administrative stuff done. So all of the regular administrative stuff that you would do, like getting new headshots or learning new monologues or reaching out to people and emailing people. And finally I was like, I'll do it. I'll start this group. Fine. And I started that group in 2016 when my grandmother, uh, my other grandfather who died of cancer, my grandmother was dying of cancer and she was on hospice that year. And so I started that group right around then. And I, I had, I had put off working on voiceover since college and I had just pushed it to the back. I'm like, oh, someday I don't really know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. I'll just keep pushing it away. And finally I was like, oh my God, like I had the mortality thing, you know, where I was like, I don't want to be my grandma's age and dying of cancer and realize I didn't do what I wanted to do. And she was in hospice. I booked a commercial playing a biopsy patient at the hospital where she and my mm. grandpa both had treatment where my sister worked. I booked this commercial and I took it as a sign because I was like, the commercial paid me something like over $3,000. And I was like, oh, the most I'd ever made on a single acting job at that point. And I was like, okay, I got this money for a reason. I'm getting my passport. I'm going to Italy next month. <laughs> like I literally got my passport. As soon as I booked that job, I was like getting my passport. And my friend was going to Commedia school in Italy. And I was like, I'm going to go visit over spring break. And, and I did, um, because I hadn't traveled outside the country yet. And that, so that summer I started the group and I got my demo made that year. And I went to Iceland and London in the fall of that year. And I also produced a fringe festival show with my best friend at the time. Um, that was a devised theater show that she and I were putting together. And so I, I just, you know, I'd had ideas for shows before I'd had ideas for films and things before, but I never had completed anything. And I think so many people struggle with that. So many people have ideas for things and they either let life get in the way because it's really easy to do when you have, you know, you have friends, you have your romantic life, you have, you know, the fun stuff. And, you know, as an actor, it's also really easy just to wait around for other people to create opportunities for you and to just take opportunities as you bump into them. And I, I finally got fed up with that and was just like, I don't want to wait around for someone else to choose me anymore. I want to choose myself. I want to create for myself. And, and that is a really scary thing too. I mean, I remember doing that show and just feeling like, you know, there is a, a vulnerability in creating your own stuff that yes, you're vulnerable as an actor, like you can get a bad review, but still you can always end up putting the blame on, oh, well, the director was terrible and they didn't direct me or whatever, right? When you're creating something that is totally your own, then it's all on you. But, you know, I think there's that quote in the Brene Brown book, which is the quote is, is it Teddy Roosevelt, where she talks about, you know, daring greatly. Like, I don't want to be critiqued by people who aren't in the ring themselves. Basically. Yeah, the, uh, the man in the arena. Yeah. And that's the thing is I, it was really hard to get critiqued when it was my first show and it was the first thing I'd produced you know, and I, I took everything very personally <laughs> and even the good reviews, my best friend was like, did you actually read that review? Cause it was pretty good actually. And I was like, no, I'm just, you know, I was very emotional about it. And she's like, no, most of it was 99% of it was great. 
And I'm like, okay, I'll go back and reread it. But it's hard. And and so I've eventually gotten to the place where you you have to just keep putting yourself out there and being brave and creating for yourself. Because otherwise your option is to sit around waiting for opportunities to happen to you. Or as the analogy I like to use is you're on a lake, you're in a canoe, you can either choose to row to a specific place and get to a specific place, or you can wait for the wind to blow and for you to bump into something, but you might get stuck in the weeds or you might end up somewhere you don't want to be. So why not pick up a paddle and just row? Or stick your hand in the water and uh, start yeah, treading. <laughs> Catch a fish. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a, that that it, that criticism can be brutal, man. I remember the I've I'm back when I was an art major. I remember the first time they ever put our um, we'd have to put up whatever we made, and the rest of the class would just rip it to shreds. And, and, and like the first time that happens, man, it's like traumatic. And this was, again, this wasn't like someone talking about me or something. I wrote It's like a, just some images I put on a piece of paper, but like yeah. that, I remember like sitting in the back of the room, I'm almost like fighting off tears, like going, what, what do you mean? You don't like it. It's not... And so, but I mean, like when it's, when it's like acting or something you wrote, it's so much, the, the attack feels so much more personal. It's one of the reasons I never, I, I, I could never be an actor because like that, just the, 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 the rejection again says it feels, it, it feels like it hits so much closer to home and it's, and it's just like, uh, the, yeah, it, it just seems like such a brutal profession to try and make it in. I mean, a lot of professions are tough, but acting in general, just that one just seems like you almost have got to have like, like a heart of steel to, to, to just kind of like stick with that for any length of time. Like actually, yeah. yeah, it's funny because like, uh, I was just thinking, cause like thinking the other day, like, man, some of the, like the, I guess, psychologically toughest people I've met are like people like you just can't rattle them or like actresses, man. Some mm -hmm. of the ones I know, like if you think you can mess with them, go try. And because it, if they've been in it long enough, like they've dealt with enough BS that like, you're not whatever little quip or whatever is not going to shake them at all. They're going to just come back like, like go away dealt with so much worse than you. Like it's, it's true. It's... I mean, I, I, I was working with a, a coach at one point. I'm not going to name names because I like this person actually, but it, you know, they looked at all my stuff and uh, you know, my marketing materials, my website, et cetera. And they, they, they made a critique of, of my stuff and, you know, we're basically like, Hey, uh, I don't even want to say it. Um, but they, they critiqued my stuff and I, I took it really personally at first and I actually ended up crying and, and, you know, I was kind of like, so, cause I thought about it afterwards and the critique I got about my work and I was thinking, I can't do anything about where I am right now. Like this is a process and I'm not going to immediately get from here to here in the next week, month, year, even, right? All I can do is keep steadily making progress towards there. And since this was a marketing coach, I was like, okay, great. I hear your critique. This is where I'm at. If you're talking about marketing me, then, you know, I was like, I'm not Coca-Cola yet. I'm tab right now. Well, guess what? You have tab to work with, market tab. How do I market tab? Because, you know, that you, you can't, you can't, you can only make incremental progress. You can't immediately magically change where you're currently at or your skill level. And I think a lot of people just see how hard it's going to be to get from tab to Coke and give up. And I've never been that person. So I'm well, just like, nope. Okay. Well. Well, it's also one thing I've noticed with actors. There's certain actors that they'll have like a breakout role and everybody so suddenly everybody recognizes, Oh, this person is brilliant. They're brilliant. And you, you can go back and look at their career and say, well, they were always brilliant. The problem was just Hollywood didn't know what to do with them until they saw them in a particular role or they were featured in a certain, you know, like again, they're, they're shown in a certain light where suddenly now 
all the unimaginative producers and directors suddenly see this person and go, Oh, that's what you do. Right. Oh, now how can I use that? And suddenly all these doors open up for them, but it's again, we talk about like, you know, making opportunities for yourself, especially for actors, because I feel like there's so many times, especially just, I think it's, it's the corporatized, you know, world that we live in where they're always trying to sell a product. And especially if you're an actor, yeah. you're the product. If they don't know what to do with you, you know, you, they'll just kind of go put you off on a shelf until they figure, Oh, this, now I have this thing and people actually like this thing. And sometimes mm -hmm. I, I, it's definitely up to the actors to kind of say, Oh no, I am, like you said, I'm not Coke, I'm tab, but there are people who really like tab. So let me go, let me take the tab to the people instead of waiting for, you know, this, the store owner to realize, Oh wait, there are people who will buy this. They don't just want Coke. Yeah. And it's like, you're, you're saying I'm not an ugly duckling. I'm a swan who just hasn't become a swan yet. And, and I think there's, there's two different things to be said about that is like, I saw a video the other day of Matthew McConaughey playing a reenactment, a character in a reenactment on, uh, unsolved mysteries back in the late eighties, maybe it was, maybe it was even early nineties, yeah. but it was before, um, days and confused in this. And I'm like, I'm sure he wasn't brilliant yet. You know what I mean? That's the thing is people, sometimes people are brilliant and it just takes that role to show them being brilliant. And sometimes it just takes them a while to grow into the best version of themselves and as an artist or whatever. But if you don't get the opportunities to do that, then that's where a lot of people, it's like you have two options. You can either start creating those for yourself and say, no, 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 this is who I am for real, which I think is the Phoebe Waller-Bridge route, right? Like create the thing you want to see. It also helps see. that she's brilliant. Maybe she a is. genius. I don't know if you've ever seen, uh, so there was an interview I saw with her that was so amazing. Because what she talked about was that she used to just create art to, as an experiment to see what worked with audiences and things. So they would do these theater productions. And I think they said she gave everyone a balloon in the audience. And it was like, if, you, if we lose, if you, if you stop being interested, let the balloon go. And so they do these experiments, these little theater experiments to see like what resonated, what worked. And it was very cool what she was trying to do because she basically just, you know, experimented to see what audiences liked and, and what, how to keep their attention, I guess. But she's, yeah, she's brilliant. Yeah. It's, it's, I think, it, well, it's funny that taps into something I've, I've talked about with other people before. Like, I think one of the, uh, the dirty little secrets of art is a lot of times we're just throwing stuff against the wall, just waiting to see what sticks. It's, it's not a, uh, for all the talk of formulas and all these things out there, like, you know, what's the, what's the secret? What's, how do you do it? And there's sometimes it's just people throwing stuff out there until, Oh, this is the thing you like. Okay. It wasn't the, nine other things I threw out. It was the one thing that I maybe the one thing out of 10 that I maybe didn't even think that much of, but now that's what the audience is responding to. Mm -hmm. So that's the direction we go in. Yeah. And it's being willing. I think that's why I say improv is the most useful thing is because it's being willing to try things and going back to the puberty thing. It's being willing to look like an idiot, to not just be pretty, to not just be nice. Like one of my theater professors in college, you know, he said, Billy, you're, you're too nice. I was like, what does that mean? I don't, cause I mean, I, I did not understand in college. I did not get it. And nobody said anything in a way that made me understand it until way later. Um, it wasn't until I was in a, a Shakespeare weekend intensive with a Shakespeare and company, I was doing a monologue personalization and the guy just looked at me and he's like, how long have you been making yourself small? And I <laughs> lost my shit. Like I was sobbing, ugly sobbing, snotting all over the place in front of everyone. I was like, oh my God. And it took me, I was a weekend intensive. So it was like 
two and a half days. And at the end of it, I couldn't even go home. I couldn't go home to my partner at the time because I was, I was so angry. I had to go to this, like, there's a little shop next door. And I went to this little shop and I just looked at things for like two hours. I couldn't do anything but like go look at things because I was just, I realized how angry I was that like I had been shaving off parts of myself and making myself smaller for years and it wasn't serving me in any way at all. Like it might serve other people when I was being nice, when I was being the good girl, it didn't serve me. And so, um, I think that's another thing about creating for yourself or making your own opportunities is you have to just be like, nope, this is what I need. This is what I need to make for me and fuck anybody else who doesn't get it. Um, but that, that's another thing about me is, uh, I am the, what my, my aunt calls, I have oppositional defiance disorder. Maybe I don't clinically have that, but I have a little <laughs> bit of that. Like if someone says I can't do something, I'm going to be like, fuck you, watch me because I, mean, I that, yeah, that attitude has taken many people, uh, throughout history a long way. Mm hmm. It's and. A, and you know, because wh why should you take somebody else's, you know, if somebody else says, mm, you're not very good. It's like, that's your opinion. And I can get better. You know, that's like your opinion, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that, I mean, no, I've, I've always I frequently have I've told because I've, uh, you know, watching people go through it during the pandemic this last year. It's like, you know, before you go around forming a low opinion of yourself, first look around and make sure you're not surrounded by assholes. And uh, unfortunately, that that uh, that happens to probably a lot of people. They they're around people who don't you know see them or don't appreciate them, and mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily that they themselves, like as an artist or writer or whatever, it's not it's not that they don't have anything to offer. You're just around people who don't appreciate it, and and I mean that's, I mean it's it's a, it's a battle. I think everyone goes through on some of even non-creatives just having someone kind of see you and see your worth mm -hmm. but i think for creatives it's even it may be it may be even worse because we've all got that look at me syndrome we all have that extra kind of need for validation or we want to like look at this thing i made or or this thing i wrote or painted or this song you know it's it's you've got that 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 extra level of it so it just tends to hurt that much more when you're around people that just don't don't care or, or just don't get it. Yeah. And I think once again, going back to improv, what improv gives you is that, that, you know, in improv, you don't ever tear something down. You only build it up, right? It's always yes. Mm -hmm. And so by doing improv, you realize, I feel like you gain a level of support in that I, there can also be toxic improv. My first improv oh, yeah. class, I left because there were a couple guys in there who were so toxic and awful, I couldn't take it. And so That's I was what like, "She said, crowd." Oh, oh. <laughs> they they were they would cut scenes immediately, and this was a beginning improv class. They would cut scenes immediately if they were like, mm, "She's not funny," and I'd be like, "We're all here to learn. We're not just here to be funny. We're not just here to be clever." Um, and so I got, I was like, I'm not, this is not a good class for me to be in. I knew once again, being surrounded by assholes, I didn't want to be surrounded by assholes while I was learning this. So I rightfully decided not to continue with the course. Cause that was level one and, and five levels to go through. I'm like, I don't want to be surrounded by assholes for this whole thing. So I waited a year and then started with level one the next year. And I ended up in an amazing class with all these really fun people and we all kind of went through it together and it was great. Well, but, good on you for, for knowing when to, uh, to bounce and not, uh, I know that there's something, you know, there's, I think that there's people would probably would have given you credit for putting up with those guys. But I was also, I feel like the, especially we've seen these days, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to put up with assholes. It's another thing to just kind of enable their assholery. And, well, and you don't, and doing that just leads to, to more of it. In theory, what should, I mean, what should maybe happen in that case is that maybe I shouldn't have had to quit. 
maybe the teacher they shouldn't have been have... assholes to begin with well <laughs> sure but i'm saying if if an asshole ends up in a class like that and they're doing they're doing behaviors that are not helpful for everyone's learning then in theory what should happen is the teacher should say hey i need you to stop cutting scenes this quickly because you're not allowing the other students to learn and then hopefully that person would learn from that and if not they could be asked to leave instead i quit which is unfortunate that it had to be that way but in my case it ended up being a much better situation because some of the other people in the class were not actors they were non-actors so it kind of made the class off balance to begin with just because they didn't have the same level of experience but yeah i it all's well that ends well it turned out fine but but i do i do hate when i have to leave a situation because of an asshole rather than the asshole leaving the situation well there's a there's a lot of discussion these days around uh you know changing those kind of those kind of things mm-hmm so uh, as we're coming up on an hour, uh, yeah, yeah. tell the tell the people where they can find you out there on the internet if they want to uh, at you. At me, um, at Billy Joe VO on Instagram. I am not on the Twitters because <laughs> Elon. I was not. I was not really on Twitter before anyway. I to be fair, Twitter was a shit show long before Elon got there. True. Um, yeah. I True, don't think he's making it any better, but it's it's uh, let's just be honest. It was a dump, it was a dumpster fire before he came along and poured his gallon of gas on it. True, but now it's a shit show where everyone can pretend to be somebody who they're not. <laughs> so, uh, but again, it was it was like I just it was like that before. I'm not defending Elon. I've got no dog in that fight. But as someone who spent some time on there, I was just going every time I was like, oh boy, it's kind of it's it's literally like you know you're t you kind of when you walk up to the dumpster and you start to get that smell, it's kind of like going in, I'm logging in now. Mm. Okay. There's, yeah, there's that. The I'm aroma not, of. I, I'm not on Twitter. I am on, uh, I'm barely on TikTok, but maybe that'll change someday. So it's Billy Joe Vio on TikTok, Twitter. I am on Facebook, but who, who pays attention to Facebook pages anymore? And LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. So. Yeah, and then my hey. website is uh, BillyJoeCones dot com, or BillyJoeVO dot com. Awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for uh, taking the time to uh, enlighten people about uh, who they're listening to when we uh, as we go forward uh, <laughs> with this podcast. Who they're listening to? Somebody is very potty mouthed, highly opinionated, <laughs> and oh. uh, ready to go on vacation. Hey, hey! All right. Well. Thank you very much. Uh, if you're out there, uh, like and subscribe. Uh, tell a friend or two or three or 20. Um, and uh, we'll see you out there. That will be all for this episode. To keep up with the show, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Scratch Claw Push. If social media isn't your thing, you can contact us at scratchclawpush at gmail.com. This podcast has been a Carcutta Media production. For a full list of our podcasts, go to carcuttamedia.com slash podcasts. This recording or any portion thereof may not be reproduced or used in any manner whatsoever without the express written permission of the publisher, except for use of brief quotations and review. Copyright 2023 by Carcutta Media, LLC. All rights reserved. Thank you.